Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Tharna Noor, joining you from Baltimore. This week, the most powerful hurricane in a decade hit the Caribbean and now threatens the states. Many climate scientists are attributing the strength of Hurricane Matthew to climate change. On Tuesday, the European Parliament backed the Paris Accord to fight climate change, tipping it over the threshold needed to enter into force after 12 more countries joined. UN Chief Ban Ki-moon called the deal historic, as did President Obama. Let's take a look at what Obama said. Today is a historic day in the fight to protect our planet for future generations. And if we follow through on the commitments that this Paris Agreement embodies, history may well judge it as a turning point for our planet. Hopes are high that the Paris Agreement will curtail increased climate change that has been linked to the growing intensity of extreme weather events. But a recent report from Argentina-based NGO, the Universal Ecological Fund, found the agreement inadequate. Joining us to discuss this is Dr. Pablo Canciani, a senior scientist at the Argentine National Research Council, CONSET, and a professor at the Universidad Tecnológica Nacional. He's one of the authors of the report, The Truth About Climate Change. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for calling. I'd like to speak with you about the inadequacies you found in the Paris Agreement, but first, uh, tell us why the Paris Agreement is still important and uh, what is to celebrate here. I think we have to celebrate in first place that with the Paris Agreement, finally we have a starting point to go into serious climate change negotiations and try to do and build a new plan or scheme for the development of society in the world. So the, as mathematician would say, we have something that is necessary but probably not sufficient. It is a starting point and we have to view it as a good starting point. I think we have to be optimistic in that sense. However, because the agreement requires that climate change stay below two degrees C, and, and that is a, kind of a, I wouldn't say a mythical figure, but it is a, a very important figure. Two degrees C means that we can avoid catastrophic climate change. We cannot avoid climate change now because of, of two things, the inertia of the climate system, which responds with a delay of 20 to 30 years on whatever action we take now, and secondly, um, beyond uh, two degrees, uh, you have that uh, the emissions that we're doing now for most greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, which is comes out from fuel emissions, fuel burning emissions, energy generation, etc., has a, a lifespan in the atmosphere of 180 to 300 years, depending on the calculations. So whatever we do now will be with humanity for at least 200 to 300 years, if not longer. So uh, we cannot say that we're going to fight back climate change. The only thing we can do is stop getting it worse. There's a growing body of scientific evidence, uh, study after study, that now links climate change to extreme weather events, such as the hurricane that just ravaged Haiti and other Caribbean countries. Uh, and just before the last G20 meeting, massive insurance companies were asking major world leaders to stop subsidizing fossil fuel corporations. Um, so my question is, does the human and financial cost of continuing to use fossil fuels at the rate that we have been uh, now outweighing the benefits of doing so? Definitely, um, especially when most of the fuel uh, is industry subsidized. Uh, clearly, we have to figure out how to change the production of energy in the world. Our main energy source has been uh, cheap energy, has been oil and gas. Um, the issue is that that can no longer go on because we are seeing the costs of doing this. It is clear that the costs far outweigh the benefits right now and far outweigh uh, what uh, we can do to prevent it getting much worse. So if, if, if we have to stop, it's the time now to stop e emitting and trying to figure out a new way for the development. Our society has become, in a sense, um, accustomed to these, the cheap energy. And the fact is that uh, humanity in the future can no longer, if we want to survive, in this planet as part of the ecosystem, as part of the biosphere, and keep the biosphere going. There's no way that we can go on spending cheap energies we are right now. So that requires uh, uh, new energy sources, many of which we already know of, like solar energy, wind energy. We can get energy out of the sea through the waves. Through the, some people are talking about using the different uh, gradients of thermal gradients in the sea to retrieve energy. So uh, there's plenty of ways to do it. 
the only thing is that it requires um, another uh, change in the way we produce it, the way we distribute it, and as well, it requires a change on the average citizen of, especially of developed countries and middle-income countries, to change the way they use the energy. That that refers to being more efficient in the way we access energy, more efficient in the way we use the energy. And 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 people don't realize it, but globally. Only 30% of the energy currently being used is uh, is made by a renewable source like hydro, hydro, hydropower or by nuclear ener- energy. 70% comes from burning fossil fuels, and that is huge. Now, a growing number of scientists are saying that uh, not only is the Paris Agreement inadequate to limit global warming, but um, also some are saying that the horse has long left the stable and that it is too late to meet the limits of uh, not only the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark, but also the less ambitious goal of 2 degrees Celsius global temperature rise set out in the agreement. Um, Do you agree that it's too late? And if not, um, can you speak about some of uh, what your suggestions are as outlined in the report? Yes. Uh, I would say that the 1.5 degree limit, lower uh, limit that we would hope for the best is almost impossible at this stage. We would need uh, to reach the two degree agreement to go into the optimum scenario from the APCC models, the 2.6 scenario, which would require a very quick turnaround by 2030 in the way we emit fuels. We cannot go on growing fuel emissions till 2030. We have to think about reducing our emissions before. And, and if we don't do that, we are probably going to overshoot the two degree mark around 270 if we're on a, if we do reach some kind of agreement. And if we do not reach an agreement at all, and if we go on with business as usual scenario, we would probably overshoot by 2050. So we have very little time to do the change. And that will require decision by governments, decision by the private sector, and uh, participation of the citizenship around the globe. Um, in the report, uh, one solution that you talk about is the need for reforestation to absorb greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, yes. You also call for intense financial investment in what, uh, what's called CCS, or carbon capture and sequestration technology. Um, CCS yes. has been a controversial subject in the environmental movement, as you and your report mm-hmm. outline. Um, and mm-hmm. opponents are arguing that if it's that uh, CCS is untested, it has the high possibility of leakage of heavy greenhouse gases like methane, which is actually worse than CO2. Um, and it takes up a lot of land, which we'll need a lot more of due to population growth. Your report says that the world population is set to increase by 40% by 2050. So how mm-hmm. would you respond to those who would ask why CCS? Uh, why not invest this money in uh, heavily renewable energy instead? Well, there are two issues with that. Um, Let's go with the simpler one. Reforestation has to be done very carefully. As you point out, if we reforest, we probably lose food production areas, and that is a problem. As you say, world population will probably stabilize around 2050, in about 20 and a half billion people. That's what the UN projects right now. Um, We have to feed people, and we have to include people in the markets. Now, right now, we have about 49, 50% of the population which are outside the markets, and that is a huge problem as well. If you go to reforestation, you have to be careful because not all reforestation generates the benefits you expect. It's the main source. You have to work with a local species, and that is crucial. You have to figure out, and that could be done, ways that you can profit from reforestation and and, and, and use the wood, for example, for permanent uh, activities like construction, like furniture, etc., so you can enhance the carbon capture. There's a lot of discussion with what we call geoengineering, which would include ca- uh, carbon capture processes. Um, there are some experiments that have been done, which have been successful. Others have been a failure, for example, seeding iron or in, uh, iron oxide in the oceans. Um, so it, it still re- depends uh, on how the technology will develop. That's why we request for investment. However, the, uh, the use of reforestation, the use of carbon capture technologies cannot completely cover, as some people have argued, the need for emission reductions. You need both emission reductions and working on techniques which are as natural as possible to capture carbon and fix it again. The other issue is if emissions go on, you will have a problem uh, with the main sink that we have right now, which are the oceans. The oceans are also warming at a slower rate than the atmosphere 
But the warming of the oceans is uh, more dangerous in two, in two crucial aspects. The first one is that as it warms, the ocean reduces its capacity to capture carbon. So as the ocean warms and becomes more acidic with the carbon, we lose the biological sinks that, cut, that retain uh, and, and reduce the carbon in the atmosphere. The, if the ocean becomes acidic, we will have problems with the biota, with the biosphere, the oceanic bi uh, biota, and um, it will warm faster. So we have to be careful with the emissions in, the, in that sense too. Um, so it's, it's, it's crucial that we reduce emissions on source, not just hoping that technology will solve the problem by, by carbon fixing. Now, the Paris Agreement is set to enter uh, into force in under a month. That's just ahead of the 22nd UN Conference of the Parties mm -hmm. in Marrakesh, uh, yes. COP22, which will begin in early November. So I'd like to wrap just by asking, uh, what do you hope goes differently in the Marrakesh Agreement? Can we expect anything better than the Paris Agreement? Well, I hope that people will revise the INDCs. The INDCs are the, the engagements countries take to reduce their emissions. Right now, there is a huge uh, dispersion in the sense that they're very different INDCs that are not going to comply or help comply with the Paris Agreement. We need countries to uh, undertake a serious revision of INDCs as required by the Paris Agreement, which is one of the best aspects of the Paris Agreement. Things have to be periodically revised. And that is a feature that was copied from the very successful Montreal Protocol. And, and uh, we, if people take seriously the revisions and the engagements they are going to make as nations, um, and I refer to nations because that way we include the participation of the citizens, we will be able to take, face this challenge. I'm optimistic in that sense. What worries me is that we need to uh, educate the citizen, as we're doing right now with your help, by talking about all of this. And we have to engage the citizen because, as, it, as we know in the field of science and the field of social sciences, this is going to be a bottom-up change. It's going to come from the citizen up through the private sector and through the government, through the, the way we can request for change. And the other thing that we have to remember with all these issues is that right now, 25% of the global population use about 80-85% of the resources, including energy, globally. We have 50% uh, of the population which only uses 3 to 4% of the natural resources or have access to the natural resources. So not only do we have to face the challenge of reducing emissions, but making this more fairly distributed globally. So that is an important issue to, to debate in all of our countries. Dr. Canciani, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for your chance to speak about this. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.